I'm Clint, and this is my first video lecture. I've been meaning to get one out earlier, but uh, my wife and I just bought a house, and we have a toddler, and we've been going through renovation hell for the last two months, which finally got wrapped up. So now I have an office to work in and a place to store my stuff, but it's too nice of a day to be working inside. So I'm out here. Uh, first of all, just welcome to the class. I'm glad you guys all signed up. Second of all, I'm getting to the grading, but what I've skimmed through, you guys are pretty much tracking and on board uh, and asking thoughtful questions. So don't stress over that. And then lastly, i uh, just going to cover what the outline of this section is. And first, the jargon will be covered. The second... I was going to try and reference something about the situation in Ukraine and I realized I wouldn't be able to really talk about it much without getting pissed off because I have a lot of friends over there that are trapped right now. But it brings me to the topic of emotion and I've been asked frequently what is the role of emotion in human evolutionary history. And it is actually quite complicated and quite interesting. So we're going to go through a scenario that you might envision actually happening in the Stone Age, and then we're going to try and picture all the emotional components of that scenario and how that build and scaffolded both culturally and evolutionarily certain behaviors, traits, and abilities. So let's get started. Okay, so it's a nice warm almost spring day here in uh, northeast Kansas, an area called the Flint Hills, which are ironically not made of flint, they're made of limestone that has chert deposits, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, the first I wanted to just mention, I know there's a ton of jargon in some of the reading that is dense, and so that's uh, what I'm going to walk through a few of those right now, and since I don't have them all memorized off the top of my head, I'm going to reference my book here. Um, so if it wasn't covered well, or if you're having trouble understanding even after this, feel free to email or message me and I will try and explain them to the best of my ability. Uh, one of them was the term working memory and executive function. These are concepts from psychology that describe two different things, but they're very important ones to know. So working memory is a very distinctly human capability in terms of how uh, much of it we have, I guess you could say. It's your ability to think about and process multiple things going on at once. So imagine somebody in an uh, airport control tower having to manage and track the trajectories of 30 different airplanes. That's an example of working memory. The other concept or term that's used is executive function, and it's a little bit more complicated, but basically it's your ability to think like maybe an executive of a business, make long-term decisions, and strategize. So think of someone who gets given $100 and they go spend it that day on something frivolous, and someone who gets $100 and they spend it on something that will make them more money in the future. That right there is a really easy explanation of what executive function is. And humans have it to a greater extent than almost any other animal. Well, than any other animal species. The other term which I did cover a bit is called phenomenology. Um, but I'll cover it again. If I'm, say, doing a flint napping experiment, I'm getting two sets of data out of that, in a sense. One is, I don't know whatever my goal was with uh, flint napping, seeing if uh, certain types of rocks make sharper edges, etc., etc. The other one, the phenomenological aspect of it, is me going through the process of flint napping itself and the emotional states that it creates, because it actually can be, <laughs> it gets, especially if you're in the flint napping world, and you've just spent six hours working on a piece of stone to make, let's say, a Clovis spear point. It gets pretty emotional because if you screw up the last couple blows on that piece of stone to make that nice, long, beautiful spear point, it's very upsetting. 
Um, but there's other factors associated with that. But that's going through that emotional, physical, and logical process is a phenomenological approach. And that's part of why I had uh, referenced the Leibenberg book and wanted um, you guys to understand the different subsistence patterns in prehistory. Um, other one, niche construction. Um, the classic example is beavers. Beavers alter their landscape, and in doing so, the landscape alters them. But they alter the landscape in a way that creates a whole new ecosystem. So by damming up a creek, they create a pond. This pond will create uh, growth opportunities for plants like willows and poplar and light, fast-growing woods, grasses, uh, fish stalks. It will attract birds. It will attract larger animals. So the beaver, by constructing a dam, has constructed a niche. And they've been doing it so long that that is how they have to live. So they make the landscape. And in time, the landscape made them into what they are now. Uh, another one is subsistence economy. I like this one because... A lot of my colleagues may not like that I do this, but I often will reference our understanding of how people survived by using economic terms, such as comparing uh, the calorie to the dollar. I do that because it makes it easier for other people to comprehend or understand what I'm talking about. So if, let's say, you're running a business and you're spending more money on uh, delivering the products that you're selling than you're making from the products you're selling, then you're going into the hole financially. You are losing money. So in the same way, if a hunter-gatherer walks five miles to go pick a basket full of berries that may only be a thousand calories worth of berries and walks five miles back, they've burned a lot more calories then they've gained from the trip. So basically they're going into the hole in a business sense, but only a calorie hole. Um, <clears throat> and this understanding of a subsistence economy, the overarching way that people derive their food, et cetera, et cetera, in a hunter-gatherer landscape, um, informs and most importantly is informed by a large number of disciplines and that's where we're going to get into uh, later in the lecture here um, <clears throat> okay uh, there was another mention of um, conceptual metaphors by a gentleman named George Lakoff uh, basically it's how we understand complicated conceptual ideas by thinking of them as a metaphor. And so, in a sense, uh, and it comes out in our language, so like, one would say a river runs, you know, uh, because it moves and travels, you know, consistently in a line the way a human running would do. By having one understanding of a concept and then thinking of it as a metaphor for a novel concept, that's a conceptual metaphor. And that probably is one of the most important things in how humans uh, acquired new information, knowledge, technology, and passed it on. One example of this is when um, I was doing some trapping research, I realized that to effectively, tra I was trapping pack rats, because, you know, uh, there's, a, there's actually a very large industry of pack rat trapping uh, among the Paiute Indians in the uh, Great Basin around Utah. Pack rats uh, exist in large numbers in nests. They're reclusive. They're very hard to hunt, but they're fairly easy to trap if you set a lot of traps. And I was 
doing just that, making primitive traps and setting them. Um, and I realized after a couple of days, I was forgetting where I'd put some of the traps or even how many traps I had set. So I had to start putting pebbles in my pocket. So every time I'd set a trap, I'd put a pebble in my pocket. The next day, when I'd go check my traps, every time I checked one, I'd take a pebble out. But in doing so, it told me kind of an exact amount of traps without having to have a number concept. But the pack rat traps and the pebbles then become anchor points or conceptual anchor points for a beginning of an understanding of number concepts. So that's the best example I can give you off the top of my head. Um, and then the last one that's not in the previous readings, but you will encounter it in the next readings, uh, is something called the chain operatoire. It's a French word literally means chain of operations. It's walking through every single step necessary to perform an activity. So if I want to, well, let me start over. This is very important in our understanding of how humans lived, acted, behaved, what they made, what their subsistence economy looked like. Okay, if a modern flint napper, somebody who takes uh, certain types of stones and hits it and turns it into arrowheads and spear points and things like that. Uh, want some flint, they will often just go to a rock shop in their car using gasoline and a paved road system and load up 300 pounds of flint, drive it back to wherever. Um, they want the right antler billet that's often used for striking the stone. You might go to a specialist online retailer and then they send it to you. So You've driven 50 miles in a modern vehicle, uh, used a digital technology to acquire these things. And then you go flint nap. And if you're making inferences about how people were behaving and you're not accounting for how they actually would have got the flint, absence of vehicle and roads and Amazon, you're missing out on a big part of what that process is. You're just examining one set of the skill, but you're not seeing the whole economic factor or the economic pattern that it had to have looked like or would have looked like in the Stone Age. So instead, you might have to make a basket, plan a route, come up with a game plan, uh, walk a great distance, load that flint, walk it back, um, find the right type of antler. You may have to go foraging the woodlands for antlers. Uh, and then you got to work those down to be capable of being put in your hand. So th that is a full chain operatoire approach to understanding through experimental archaeology something like flint napping in the Stone Age. And I'm going to pause here because I got some props that will make some of these points uh, more relatable, I think. Okay, emotions in prehistory, why they matter, how they affected us. And on that note, the word that we often use to describe the role of emotion in biology is affect. Not affect, but affect, how something affects you. And to do that, we're going to cover, let's say... A foraging expedition from two million years ago to go get bone marrow on the African prairie or savanna. Now, right now, I'm in a woodland timber. This is where most of our ancestors spent most of their time, particularly in the early stages of human evolution. There's a lot more safety in a place like this from the large predatory animals of the day, like lions, big cats, things like that. In a place like this, you have an area that you're familiar with, you campsite, you got human smells, uh, you can put up barricades, but you go out of this area and you go out onto the prairie as a small group of people and you have suddenly put yourself at the mercy 
of animals that can run much faster than you. And the humans, or the early humans, were a lot smaller than us. So, to move from woodland to prairie to savanna is a dangerous thing. Okay. The other thing I'm going to address is a sort of debate in archaeology about when hunting started. And to start with that, we're going to do a sort of uh, chain operatoire, the chain of operations, of not just uh, making a stone tool, but using a stone tool. And then how that impacts you, where the physiology comes in, uh, the modern medicine, things like that. So I've got my little red wagon full of stone agey things. Fun. <clears throat> First off, this is a pretty hand axe. This one is about 800,000 years old. It was found in the Nafu Desert of Saudi Arabia. I was allowed to keep it so I could make replicas of it for an experiment. It wouldn't have looked like this when it was found. If you can see the light reflecting, that's desert polish. That's 800,000 years of sand grains and desert wind battering it, but making it smooth and pretty and shiny. It's great. One of the research projects I was involved in was called the Ugly Hand Axe Project. It was called that because most, and when I say most, I mean 98% of the hand axes we find in prehistory, particularly the really old ones, don't look this nice, okay? Most of them look more along the lines of something like this. The problem is we get a curation bias, is what it's called. You go to a museum that has prehistoric stuff, and they're not going to show you, they don't want to show you the ugly hand axes, the ones that make up 90-something percent of all of the recovered hand axes. They want to show you their nicest and best ones. So that creates a misperception amongst not just the general populace, but archaeologists. Why were people making these? These, you can see by the edges, they're not going to cut meat very well. Well, I had a speculation based off of some research I'd done on how the uh, Plains Indians survived winters in North Dakota, places like that, before the introduction of the horse and things like that. <laughs> that they weren't using hand axes to cut meat. And we don't really start getting hand axes that look like they could cut meat till we have pretty hard evidence for hunting. We're talking 600 to 800,000 years ago. And those types of hand axes look like this. This is one I made, but this cuts meat very well. Okay, so one thing I learned about survival sorry, on the high plains was that one of the primary reasons the high plains hunter-gatherers uh, would cooperatively bison hunt was not just the meat. In fact, that might have been secondary. It was the bone marrow and the fat. This is a large cow bone. You break that open, maybe not now, this one's pretty old. There is a lot of bone marrow in there. Now bone marrow has about four times the calorie density of meat for most mammals. It also has a lot of nutrients. Okay, cool. Well, let's imagine I'm going to pause for a sec because of the stupid airplanes overhead, so I'll just turn it back on when the plane's off. plane's gone. I think the airplane's mostly gone. All right. In the previous section, we talked about, well, several previous sections ago, we talked about how difficult it is for an animal species to evolve a larger head size relative to body size, and that other animals can evolve larger overall body sizes with proportionate heads much, much more quickly than a species can evolve just a bigger head with the body staying the same. Three million, four million years ago, we had a very nice spell. Uh, stable climate, 
a lot of biomass became available on the grasslands. So by we say biomass, we might also use the term carrying capacity. We're talking about the amount of edible plant material, usually plant material, on a given landscape. And when you have uh, periods of climatic stability and nice weather, you get lush grasslands that encourage bigger populations and in some cases larger animal sizes. So we start getting what we call the megafauna. These really big animals start evolving such as the mammoth and the imperial elephant things like that. Well the animals that scavenge those big animals couldn't keep up evolutionarily speaking to the full extent. So you've got hyenas that come in after a kill, lion kill, or just an animal died by natural causes. And one of their specialties is finding whatever meat is left, eating any of the organ meats that none of the animals got to, but using these giant skulls, jaws, teeth to crush bone. And to crush bones like this, they get the marrow. Great. Okay. Well, as the animals got bigger, that meant their bones got bigger. The scavengers like the hyenas didn't evolve heads to get bigger at the same rate, which, you know, larger jaws, greater crushing power, which needs attachment points for muscle tissue, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, what this left was a sort of economic opportunity, an opening, as it were. Because long after the meat's been stripped off the flesh of an animal, the marrow inside the bone can stay perfectly edible. So, if you are a early human relative, primarily gathering uh, and obtaining bones when you can, if you can get to one that hasn't been completely demolished by the hyenas and things, you're going to be really looking forward to bone marrow any chance you can get it because it's so nutritious. I mean, literally four times the calories of the exact same amount of meat by volume, I think. But you get these huge bones that are filled essentially with nutrient rich butter. And if the bone hasn't been disturbed too much, the marrow inside is so dense it doesn't rot right away. Okay, cool. That usually would have been found on a grassland because that's where a lot of the big cats that hunt individually or hunt in groups chase down the big grass-eating animals. At that time, humans were mostly woodland dwellers or forest or jungle because the big grasslands are real dangerous for the same reason it's dangerous for, you know, a zebra or a gazelle. And these little tiny stubby humans with no weapons were <laughs> like snacks for the uh, predators of the time. <clears throat> okay. Well, at some point, humans start figuring out if you see turkey buzzards flying, you know, from the edge of the forest you see out over the grassland, that's a sign of an animal kill. If you want to go out, Wait till the hyenas are gone because they, you know that there are bones that they couldn't get their jaws around and break into. You're taking a big risk. And it's a grassland, so there's not a lot of available rocks like behind me to pick up to use as hammer and anvils to crush that bone. And you want to get that bone and get the heck out of there as quick as you can. And some of those bones might have been massive. It might have been very difficult to carry them. And I don't know, but even me, I wouldn't want to have to haul something like this with me and, you know, eight of my relatives into a dangerous situation just so I had a hammer and anvil. So my speculation was that they were going after bone marrow. And that came about because when I discovered the subsistence economy of, let's say, the Pawnee, 
that's what they were after. What they would do is collectively hunt, drive game off cliffs, etc. Several hundred animals at once. They'd get together and they'd spend a week butchering the things, extracting all the marrow from the bones, rendering the fat down so it's shelf stable, drying all the meat. And then they'd mix that all together with some dried berries and whatever else into an animal rawhide from the animals they'd killed. Wrap it up, and I think the French word for it is flechette, which doesn't make any sense to me, but one animal's entire worth of meat, fat, marrow that it had been rendered and melted, and then the dried meat mixed in with it, and then it hardens, gets wrapped up in a rawhide. It was estimated that you needed one of those per person to survive winter on the American plains. Okay. Well, so in the debate over were humans hunting two million years ago and they were using these tools to cut the meat, it didn't seem to hold true because I'd used enough of these stone tools to know that this is pretty useless for cutting meat off a large animal. I mean, there's just no sharp edges. But this is what we find primarily. And to prove point to it, we don't find a lot of things like this. But when you find flint, this is chert, which is just kind of a low-grade form of flint, really. But when you find deposits like this that you're going to make stone tools out of, you often will find stuff that's already flaked off into sharp knife edges. Yet we don't find a whole lot of these relative to these ugly hand axes. Okay, to put this to the test, I made a number of replicas of nice ones like this, but also the ugly ones from Saudi Arabia, Africa, you name it, all over the world. I took models, uh, and then I sat and flint napped a bunch of ugly hand axes that look almost identical to the ones in the museum drawers that you never see. I also then made a bunch of nice ones that we don't really see in the record. You know, sharp edges, easy to hold, a lot smaller. We don't see these till about 800,000 years, roughly. 800 to 700,000 years is also when we start seeing firm evidence for hunting. Okay. So it was my speculation that people were manufacturing tools like this because they're portable to take out onto the plains, the prairie, to crush the bones that were left behind because the hyenas have abandoned them and get as much marrow as they can and get back. This is a light portable solution to bringing, uh, you know, essentially a Stone Age can opener out onto a landscape without having to carry heavy rocks and boulders. And it's a landscape that's not going to have a lot of exposed rock and other easy access things to break those bones open. Made a bunch of replicas, went to the University of Liverpool. We had like a kinesiology lab. They hooked me up to a bunch of little diodes and things, uh, which are in a couple of the pictures I posted at the beginning on the syllabus. And we tested the two types against a number of different bones, both for fracturing the bones, getting the meat out or the marrow, and then for cutting the meat. And it was just hands down uh, almost a 99% result that these actually are fantastic bone can openers. Because they're not so thin, and because it's not the nicest material, which is another thing, people were bypassing nicer material to find rougher material to make it. This rougher material is more solid. It withstands impact fractures a lot better. The very nice, pretty ones are terrible at getting into bone. And in fact, it was sad to watch as I did it. Because <laughs> I'm in this lab, they got all these little light diodes and cameras measuring force, direction, trajectory, and then under the bones was a pressure plate. And I had spent so much time working on these really beautiful ones. And uh, every one of them, first couple hits against a bone, the end would just break off. And I was like, oh, that's eight hours. Oh. So there's an emotional component there because it was sad to watch. Uh, it just told me basically that it seems very unlikely the first people making tools were using them to hunt and cut meat. They were probably using them to break open bone marrow by exploiting this resource that is 
evolution hadn't caught up with to utilize. Okay, so for me, that's part of the understanding of where the physiology and the experimental archaeology, kinesiology, start coming together in our discipline. So there's another, a notable property of flint, and that good flint makes a very nice noise. So I'm going to take a pause, and then we'll talk about what the noises mean, what the emotions mean, and what the hunt or the gathering of marrow might have looked and sounded like. So before we launch into uh, what the emotional affective relationship of a hunter-gatherer hunt or gather two million years ago might look like, I'm going to introduce a concept called hygge. It's a Scandinavian term. It basically refers to comfort, warmth. It has things to do with basically winter and preventing and surviving winter. And so people see a picture of a cabin in a snowy woodland with a, a window lit. You, or you can see firelight through the window. It feels comfortable. Firewood, axes, these are all part of Scandinavian culture because their relationship with these tools and this material allowed them to survive basically... Uh, one of the northernmost landscapes on the planet. And so over time, a large number of relationships developed with the tools and the lifestyle that people find very emotionally comforting. And so in recent years, the term hug has been used as a marketing term to sell everything from socks to really expensive hatchets and adzes and woodcutting malls and things like that. Well, so that's kind of a modern example of how a relationship with the landscape and a certain culture built into a culture, an emotional relationship with the tools and the materials and the lifestyle. And in fact, there's like a sort of folk logic that goes on in Finland, Sweden, places like that, on how women should choose their men based off how well their woodpile stacked. And so old Swedish grandmothers have these like set of rules. If a man stacks his wood very precisely in alternating rows, then he's probably a little bit anal retentive and you're going to be marrying somebody who's maybe hard to deal with. And if a man has a disorganized stack, then he's probably a lazy bum. There's actually 12 different rules on this specific topic. <clears throat> and so one of the things any would-be suitor, maybe not now, but 100 years ago, would have to go through when asking her, you know, a woman out or to court them, would be have her father or grandmother come inspect his woodpile. Because if your woodpile isn't adequate, you don't survive winter. So you can imagine why that relationship developed. And from there, we're going to go back 2 million years and look for the same thing. Okay, so this is a walkthrough of a two million year old bone marrow expedition for a small group of forager gatherers who are living on the edges of a woodland next to a prairie or savanna ecosystem. One that doesn't have a giant red roof building, but okay. So somebody comes back and reports, hey, I see. Turkey, uh, turkey buzzards or vultures flying that way quite a ways. Or maybe your group's hungry, you haven't eaten in a while. It's been a lean season. Well, that's exciting. Everybody gets amped up. Uh, if you haven't eaten for a while, you know, start drooling, thinking I'm anticipating tasty, tasty bone meal. So, what do you do? Well, one, you're not just going to go head first out there because there's probably still hyenas, lions, things like that, picking apart the remains of that animal. You're going to kind of want to wait probably till the buzzards are gone because then you know there's nothing probably left to scavenge, which means you won't have the threat of predators that are also scavengers like hyenas, which can be nasty, nasty creatures, 
So you're going to take your time and prep your operation. So that might mean coming to a place like this. A uh, creek system with a lot of exposed rock that can give you the tools you need to get at that marrow. While you might uh, pass up something like this, which actually has a fairly high chert content, because you know that if you use it to break open bone marrow, it's going to fracture, per the experiment I referenced earlier. And even just coming to this place might be a drastic uh, move in itself. You might have to plan a journey of several miles or whatever to a place that you know has the best flint but is not a place where you normally live. So that might be planning with your group because maybe you've busted most of the hand axes you've made and you need some new ones. Okay. So you come out here. You're very cautious. You're very careful. You're probably taking paths like this one, maybe have a person taking an upper path so they can scout for predators, because at that time, ambush predators like big cats were a real danger. And it wasn't just out on the prairie, but at least in a landscape like this, you have more opportunity to defend yourself. And you can see they can't hide as easily as they can in the tall grass. Okay, so we're here. You've probably brought a rounded stone, your hammer stone. This is what we make our stone tools with. Uh, if you, had, you wouldn't have had an antler billet back then. We don't have evidence people were making tools using these types of materials, which are how you make the really thin, nice tools, uh, until much, much more recently. Okay, so we don't need that. What you do need are hard, round rocks. Hammer stones. And you're going to come through. Maybe uh, the teenagers are with you. And this is like their training tutorial. So they're allowed to go on this trip. And you're going to test rocks by listening to them. So I'm hitting this piece of limestone. Now a lot of the limestone around here has a reasonable amount of silica, what glass is made of. Uh, and that is what allows the rocks to fracture in a term they call conchoidally. But basically it's, you hit glass, imagine a BB hitting a windshield and it makes a cone that pops out. So when you hit glassy rock with stone, it makes that shape, only you're getting half a cone because half a rock. And sometimes on the really nice stuff, you can actually see the energy waves in the ripples of what's left after you take a piece off. So I'm going to reposition this camera a bit just to show you a little bit of this because it is experimental archaeology and you'll have to excuse my primitive filming techniques because all my good equipment is still in storage at the moment. Okay, cool. Well, let's test. And one thing you'll notice is the sound. Alright, so we've got this guy here. Let's put him on our knee. Well, not a great sound, but you can see we're starting to get towards an ugly hand axe like ones I showed earlier. But you can still hear a little bit of ting. So that tells you that this might be a suitable material. So you're going to work it. And the younger people that are with you, they might be practicing as well, taking some of the less nice material. If you've brought your family and the kids, etc., etc., this sound of flint napping, this is a glassier piece, so you'll hear it here. And you can see it makes much sharper edges. This might be about right. This sound might be this, basically the dinner bell sound. If you're a kid, every time you hear this, that means that there's food on the horizon. This is where your emotional relationship with your materials, your culture, and your behavior starts being developed. The term affect. You are being affected. Listen to that. Okay. So... 
everybody going on this hunting party is doing this right here. And you're a kid sitting on a log there. And this is like being in grandma's kitchen, listening to the sounds of her cook your favorite comfort food, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, once you've got roughly what you're after, now I spend more time and retouch the edges on this, but fine. See that? Okay. Once you have roughly what you're after, now maybe it's time to go send your party out, find those big bones, and crack into them. So that's what you do. But at this stage, we're actually having to start doing some social planning, coordinating, organization. Heading out onto this landscape is really dangerous. So you need to keep your group tight together. You might also be able to use this defensively. Because if a large animal suddenly bursts through the grass coming at you, but you're in a tight group, and instead of your weak little pink hands, you have a big, hard, sharp, pointy thing, that animal might reconsider its life choices if it gets hit in the face with one of these. So there may be another component to this of security, feeling secure. This goes back to the hoga concept. Okay, so you take your party out, find your bone, get as much marrow as possible. Oh wait, how are you going to get it back? Oh, I don't know. Did you do any planning for that? Well, probably the first people just gathered what they could and carried it back, maybe in a piece of old animal skin, I'm not sure. But at some point, they had to have started developing containers. And so, adding to this process might be something like making a basket like this. And this is a fairly simple basket to make. You can make one in about 30 minutes out of willow limbs, dogwood limbs, almost any of the little small shrubby things you see around here. But this basket can hold a lot of marrow or bone. And if you line it with something grassy in the bottom, more liquidy things or small things like berries won't fall out. Add that step into it. That might be something the kids help with. That's sort of like helping grandma mix the cookie batter, you know? All right, you've got your food, you come back, everybody's on the edge, the rest of the family, edge of the wood line, waiting to see if you make it back safely, and you do. And maybe you brought bones with you, and maybe you're using the tools slightly differently, the smaller little shards and things like that, that you're asking the kids to make, to get all the little nooks and crannies out, get all that marrow. Now this is before fire. You don't have to cook bone marrow. And uh, you can see right there, all of these emotional relationships starting to develop. Well, emotions are interesting for a couple reasons. One, they actually turn on and off hormonal triggers. Two, the concept of neuroplasticity comes in. And that is the ability of your brain, literally, to rewire itself through repeated activity of a certain type. So if you're using, performing an activity that's relying heavily on one part of your brain, uh, the brain then gets positive emotional signals sent with that activity repeatedly. That triggers neuronal bundling and recruiting and recycling. What that means is uh, neurons are being told by your hormones to start serving another purpose. They get kind of rerouted towards the activity such as flint napping, etc., etc. And that causes a permanent change in your brain. Well, that's pretty cool. So the action gave an emotional relationship. The emotional relationship created a hormonal neurochemical relationship that literally rewired the brain. And that's going to get passed on culturally. But now with the study of epigenetics, they're also starting to think that some of those changes turn on and off coding genes. 
for certain expressed traits. Okay, that's really weird. So if you do something long enough, say you're a 20 year old man or woman, and you've done this activity a bunch and it's been successful when you positive emotional relationships with it, the kids you have after that age, after that activity, may have received different coding gene uh, instructions, essentially. So they will be the beneficiary and may have different expressed traits than before you did that activity. And through this, you can kind of start to see where all these factors come together. And then at that point, we start seeing the gut length starting to shorten as our brains expand. Animals that eat a lot of fibrous plant material have to have very long guts for the digestive part of it. But animals that rely more on meats and fats have much shorter guts because those digest much more readily. So now we get a trade-off. Shorter gut, bigger brain, all coming about through this emotional valence, affect, scaffold. I think that's pretty cool. Right. Okay. Well, this is going to be the end of this lecture series. Well, this lecture. And one thing I might add in terms of where uh, the this understanding that we're slowly gaining about our evolutionary history uh, could have a real useful impact in the modern world is in stuff uh, like treatment of PTSD. So PTSD is exact is essentially a very direct example of that emotional neural response that comes from something significant. Only, uh, there's a lot of debate over the types of PTSD, but there's generally speaking acute. One thing happened to you, like 9-11, etc. And that's where you get sort of flashbacks, triggers, relating to a very distinct but very impactful trauma that kicked off a cascade of hormones that sent different signals to your brain that literally changed it. And then you have long-term endemic PTSD. You're going through a fearful thing over and over and over again. And what that tends to do is change your hormonal regulation over time. So instead of creating a dramatic intense post-traumatic stress reaction, you get one that's more or less a... Uh, an imbalance, a neurochemical imbalance. You see it a lot with people who've been long-term victims of sexual abuse. You see it a lot with soldiers who were in not just a, a single episode of combat, but who had to go see combat day after day after day after day, thinking you're going to die. And I can speak from experience on this because I 2007 surge, I did over 200 combat operations or patrols. And the first day we watched the team we were replacing have their, uh, they were giving us a tour. Their Humvee hit an underground bomb that flipped the thing up in the air five or six times. It threw everybody out of the vehicle. Fortunately, everybody lived. I don't know how the hell they lived. Nobody, strangely, it's because nobody was wearing seatbelts. The gunner on the top got thrown about 80 feet forward. They all had broken pelvises and yada, yada. That was the first thing we saw. We knew we were in a dangerous area, and we, my whole team, looked at each other after we met back to everybody. And we're like, uh "Oh, what are we in for?" And so, for the first two or three months, uh, I talked to my old teammates. Everybody was just scared shitless. I mean, that's a fact. We just like we went and did our jobs, but you didn't do it without just a sinking sense of dread, horrible dread. And what was interesting is it wasn't getting in fights with people. And this is where we talk, start talking about things like agency. Special Forces is very good with guns and fighting and tactics. It's the dang IEDs, the bombs, that you couldn't really do anything about. You had no agency or any control over... You could be the most highly trained warrior on the planet, but if you're in a Humvee that gets hit with a 500-pound underground bomb, you die. It might be a really terrible death. 
So that lack of agency for the guys I knew on my team and fear of dying that way and watching a lot of people die that way is what gave most of our guys PTSD. It had nothing to do with getting in gunfights. That's what we were trained for. We were working with the best people around us you could possibly work with. We knew what we were doing. We were better than the other groups we were fighting. So most guys I talk to don't have PTSD from that. And so there's another component to this. Agency. How in charge do you feel of your, your fate, your situation? Being in a vehicle in an area that had one road in, one road out, and it looked like the crater of the moon, you had no agency. It didn't really matter who you were. And so that was very impactful for a lot of people because we were there 10, 11 months, and every day you had to go down that road, and every day you watch people die on it. Okay, so that is an example of affect. Previously, I've just referenced positive affective relationships. This is a good example of a negative one. And we have examples of how people who go through stuff like this, people, Holocaust survivors, etc., have genetic changes that get transmitted generationally. And so that's a very interesting field of research that's just now really being explored. I mean, we're just at the, the beginning of our understanding of this. So that's it. Um, if I have an assignment, I will post it on the board. But otherwise, uh, nice to meet you all digitally. And... I look forward to grading the rest of your papers and seeing what you have to say. Till later.